there's a little countdown and uh, let's go ahead and let's look at the uh, chapter 10 slides which for the most part have the quiz questions embedded okay so we'll do them as we go along uh, rather than wait till the end to uh, look at those okay so let's go ahead and take a look at chapter 10 and we're going to start dealing with uh, and they're saying in general deductions and losses I would say for the most part we're talking about itemized deductions we're talking about deductions from AGI here now the below the line deductions although there's a few that pop in here like the uh, student loan interest uh, that's actually a deduction for AGI but for the most part we're talking about itemized deductions okay so if you take a look at um, the 1040 and uh, we're now looking at uh, we can feel good that we finally made our way over to page 2 of the 1040 you can see that we are talking about what our itemized deductions and that's going to come from Schedule C and of course we use itemized deductions if they are more than the standard deduction if the standard deduction is more then we would just go ahead and take the standard deduction rather than take the itemized deductions okay so this is schedule a okay and you can see that the list the itemized deductions and uh, when we go through the way we've organized the slides for this chapter we're just going to go through the different uh, itemized deductions medical expenses what are the rules there taxes state and local taxes uh, for the most part interest okay and we'll talk about uh, charity deductions which have some interesting rules uh, casualty and theft loss uh, we will get to maybe uh, when we talk about losses in other chapters so we don't get to that too much in here but we will talk about uh, these other miscellaneous deductions in here if we don't get to it this time we'll get to it next time that's sort of towards the end of the chapter so we're literally just going down this schedule a and then whatever the total of the itemized deductions are if it is more than the standard deduction we deposit that you know on page 2 of 1040 and uh, that reduces obviously our taxable income okay so again uh, you can see the listing here that we're going to talk about in this chapter and you can see the uh, correlation between this slide and what is listed on the schedule a Okay, so itemized deductions provide a benefit to taxpayer, again, only to the extent that they will be exceeding the standard deduction. Standard deduction is more, you'll just take the standard deduction and probably more, you know, one of the arguments I kept hearing about, oh, well, you know, uh, the, the new tax law is better because you just take the standard deduction and that's easier for taxpayers to figure out. And I'm like, oh, yes, we don't want taxpayers to use their brain at all and figure out if they're, you know, do the simple task of filling out if their itemized deductions are more than their standard deduction. Um, so it was, to me, it was a, kind of make an excuse. But anyway, um, the, since they've increased the standard deduction, uh, maybe going forward, I'm sure more people will take a standard deduction than the itemized deductions. Okay, so you start to take a look and uh, we talk about medical expenses. Okay, and medical expenses are deductible to the extent that they exceed 10% of our adjusted gross income. So remember, we kept saying AGI was an important number because it's used as a base for a lot of the itemized deduction. If you're 65 or over, they lower that threshold to 7.5%. Sometimes the book calls it a floor, and I don't like that term floor because it's more of a hurdle, right? Once you get past amounts that are in excess of 10%, if you're 65, it's 7.5%. Uh, until 2017 when it was to increase to 10%, but then the Tax Cuts, tax cuts and Job Act preserved the deduction for medical expenses and changed the floor, I call it a hurdle, to 7.5% for all taxpayers for 2017 and 2018, and then it'll go back up to 10% uh, after 2018. And I got to the point when I looked at that, I'm like, I am not holding you guys accountable to these numbers nonsense percentages that they put so what I'm gonna do is if um, we have a we will have questions about the itemized deduction for medical expenses and I'll just tell you the percentage to use I'm not gonna sit here and hold you accountable to these shifting 
percentages that they can't seem to make up their mind. You know, first they say, well, we don't want to bother people with itemized deducts and make it more complicated. Then they have it. Well, it was 7.5. Then it's going to go to 10. Then it'll go back to 7.5. Make up your mind, please. Okay, so uh, we'll just go ahead and I'll call out the percentage to you. Okay, but let's just go ahead in your test questions. Um, you may see some homework questions. I'm not going to do it for every homework question where you're going to have to know, but the solution's right there, and they'll tell you the percentage. But for our test, I'm going to, when I say homework questions, I mean the quiz questions that we do. But for our uh, test itself, I will call out the percentage, okay, off for the midterm. All right, so example of medical expenses, deduction limitation, Amy's 24 has AGI of 10,000, medical expenses of 1,500, so she can deduct 500 because that's in excess, and here they're using the 10% uh, threshold, okay? Uh, she's younger, right? For Bob, who's uh, a little older, 67, and uh, has AGI of 4,000, medical expenses of 1,000, holy Toledo, this guy's spent all his money on medical expenses, but what happens? He can take amounts that are in excess of that uh, now 7.5 percent because he's 65 or whatever what was the age 65 okay he's past the age i will expect you to know the age but again now nah, i won't i'll call out the percentage i'm gonna call out the percentage whatever it is that i want you to use okay all right okay good now you come over and what constitutes a medical expense oh i'm not highlighting huh you guys want me to highlight? You like when I highlight? You don't like when I highlight? I'm a little so I'm a highlight everything, but um, so I'll I'll save us the highlighting, okay? Um, unless you want me to. No? Okay. Do you like the different colors? The green versus the yellow? Okay. So something that I want to uh, emphasize, I'll highlight. Expenditures for what constitutes a medical expenditure? Um, anything for the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, prevention of the disease. Okay, and uh, the purpose of affecting any structure or function so if, um, of the body, um, and it uh, can be not only for the taxpayer but also what their spouses and dependents. Okay, and it includes prescription drugs and insulin and I got to be honest with you I don't know why they keep calling out insulin as though it's not a prescription drug I mean can you just go you know uh, into a drugstore and walk in and score yourself some insulin without a prescription can you do that though can you just walk in a store and say hey man can I get some insulin I mean I, I don't know I would have thought insulin is dangerous I mean if you were to you know wanted to like you know get rid of somebody you could give them a shot of insulin and they'll be wiped out I mean they'll be gone they won't last long if you overdose insulin so I'm not sure why that's not prescription maybe in some states it's not I don't know but uh, yeah so they include insulin in this discussion uh, as an over-counter drug for some reason and then of course prescription drugs okay I mean, some people can't live without insulin, right? I mean, diabetics just die if they don't have insulin, a lot of them. Uh, you know how they found, discovered that insulin was needed is the guy removed the pancreas of dogs, and then the dogs, of course, urinated, and then the ants were going to the urine, and that's when the guy who discovered that diabetics need insulin realized, oh, okay, the pancreas isn't giving something and figured out that it was insulin, and he won, he won Nobel Peace Prize for that. Before then, I mean, diabetes was a death sentence if somebody got it, and so... Uh, so kind of a big deal for for diabetics. So I'm not sure why they call that out as not being uh, not being a prescription drug. But fine, just remember that insulin is uh, something that's considered a drug. Okay, prescription drugs and insulin. Okay, uh, does not include the cost of items such as unnecessary cosmetic surgery. Now, if I sit here and I say, hey, I want some surgery so I'm better looking, you may say, yeah, John, that's absolutely necessary, okay? But as far as the tax code's concerned, that is unnecessary, okay? So hair transplants, that kind of thing, I want my, I want to have a better chin or something, that is not deductible, okay? Uh, general health items, you know, you're not going to be able to take a uh, write-off for, well, geez, you know, I have a pair of running shoes. That's a, a health item because it helps me with my health. With my health, uh, that's a 
medical expense, no, uh, non-prescription drugs, okay, except, I guess, insulin, they're saying it can be non-prescription, okay, if cosmetic surgery is deemed necessary, it is deductible as a medical expense, okay, so if it deals with, um, you know, abnormalities uh, such as deformity arising from a congenital uh, abnormality, um, you know, somebody has a clef, uh, cleft palate um, that they're born with, you know, can be very unsightly. It's also dangerous as well, but it's more unsightly. Well, that's not cosmetic surgery, okay? That's something that, you know, the person just, you know, would have trouble functioning in society because of that. That's not considered cosmetic. Personal injury, you fall flat and you smack your face, okay, that's something that they're going to say, okay, we got to, you know, we got to fix that. And so we'll, uh, we'll deal with that disfiguring disease. I don't know. You get uh, that flesh eating disease or something. I don't know. And they have to fix it up. Uh, whatever. Okay. So these are all things, but not, hey, I want a prettier nose. Those sorts of things are not considered de uh, deductible. Now, if you can't breathe because your nose and in the process, you know, they fix the nose and it ends up looking better at the end, then that would be, you know, something that would be deductible. Okay. All right. So we take a look and uh, uh, they are deductible in the year they are paid, even if they are paid by uh, check or, uh, uh, or credit card. Okay. So they're deductible in the year they're paid. Okay. Now they talk about things that are non-deductible. Okay. Funeral, burial expenses are not a medical deduction. Okay. Um, Diaper service, maternity clothes, okay, weight reduction, no. I mean, you know, I look at that, I mean, weight can be a real uh, health problem, but they don't allow you to deduct that, okay? Unnecessary cosmetic surgery. Again, I want my chin to look better, okay? All right, but you got a pretty good list here of things um, that would, um, oh, okay. That was what I was thinking. Why not weight reduction? But it has to be that it's related to obesity. Obesity meaning that the person's health is severely being affected. Okay, so uh, not uh, something that's just going to help you take off a few pounds. But if you're considered diagnosed as obese, um, then they would allow you to deduct that. Okay. All right. Some pretty obvious things there. Okay, nursing home expenditure. If the primary reason is because of medical uh, reasons, then the cost, including meals and lodging, um, would make that deductible. Now, you say, well, why else would someone go into a nursing home unless it was medically necessary? Well, you know, if you've got your... Uh, you know, parents living with you, and you say, hey, you know, every time uh, we have a party, you're in the way. we got to get you out of here, so we're going to put you in a nursing home. Well, that's not considered medically necessary, okay? But if it's a deal where, hey, you know, uh, dad needs somebody to, you know, get his heart started every morning or something, you know, there's an ailment or something that requires an, a medical professional to be there doing that, then yes, that then the cost of the nursing home would be deductible, okay? So if it's personal reason, no, okay? You know, we just can't. See, we don't have room for, for pop anymore. We're going to take them over to the, the local nursing home and leave them on the front porch or something. That is not considered a uh, legitimate expense. The, uh, my dad said the other day, you know why people have kids? And I'm like, no, why? He says, so there's somebody to drive them to the old folks' home. Okay, so. No one's driving you to the old folks' home. My dad is strange in that he keeps thinking that I'm trying to figure out a way to take him to the old folks' home. Now he came up with this thing. Now, when have I suggested that in any manner? You know, so I guess you get older, you start worrying. You never get there, right? When you're young, you're worried about college. Then you start working, you're worried about your job. Then you start getting a little older, you start worrying about retirement. And then when you retire, you worry about someone taking you to an old folks' home, I guess. So you never get there. Is there expenses for in-home care system for the elderly? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if it's a medical expense, if you're paying to have a nurse, but it's got to be related to medical 
expenses. Yeah, it can't be. So in other words, I don't think they're going to give you for assisted living type of thing where the person just needs help prepping meals and that kind of stuff. But if it's a medical expense and you have to have a nurse come in and change diapers and, you know, these kinds of things for an elderly person, then yeah, it doesn't have to be in a medical facility. Yeah. Okay. Now, again, it's to the extent that it exceeds, obviously, the, uh, the percentages over AGI, though, right? Okay, so these we're talking about itemized deductions here. So Norman, okay, has a chronic heart ailment. In October, his family decides to place Norman in a nursing home equipped to provide medical and nursing care. Okay, total nursing home expenses amounted to eighty thousand during the year. Of the amount fifty thousand is directly attributable to the uh, nursing care. Because Norman is in need of significant medical nursing care and is placed in the facility primarily for the perp for this purpose, all eighty thousand. So we're able to include the boarding part of that as well because he went in for uh, medical purposes. And by the way, they make it sound, you know, they say placed in there like somebody else had to make the decision. I mean, it can be a self-election. Hey, I'm having so much trouble. I need to go into a nursing home. It's not like somebody's got to, you know, take over your life and tell you you got to go there. Okay, you can decide to go there yourself. Okay. All right, good. Medical expense deduction may include the expense of a special school for disabled individuals. I guess the tax law still calls them handicapped for some reason, maybe. I don't know. Or this slide is the thing that's inappropriate. They put in a handicap up there. Disabled would be the correct term as far as uh, I'm concerned. But deduction is allowed for a principal reason for sending the individual to school and the school special resources for alleviating the infirmity, school for the blind, or something like that, right? Okay, so in this case, the cost of meals and lodging, in addition to the tuition at the school, are all considered a medical deduction. So if somebody goes to school, like I say, for the blind, obviously, blind individuals are going to need special schooling to help, you know, help with the... Uh, the issue of being blind, then um, the tuition as well as uh, meals and lodging are all considered medical expenses. Okay, uh, what about capital medical expenditures? Okay, could include a pool, air conditioners, and we're going to see that there's a limitation on the next slide as to what you can take for capital expenditures if they constitute a permanent improvement to the property. So you put this high class pool in your backyard, you know, because somebody needs a pool for um, some sort of medical purpose. You can deduct some of it, but they're not going to let you deduct all of it to the extent that it increases the value of the property. They won't let you deduct that. But any amounts that you spend over and above the appraised amount of the improvement, um, they will. Um, they won't let you deduct that, but they'll let you deduct up to um, the amount of the uh, increase in value. We'll look at the example in a minute, and that's going to be a little better than my the way I'm bludgeoning the explanation right now. Okay, so it must be medically necessary, has to be advised by a physician and used primarily by the patient. Okay, and it has to be a reasonable expense. Okay. Full amount of cost is an expense in the year paid, and the maintenance on that is also going to be considered a uh, medical expenditure if you have to service uh, this pool or this elevator or whatever it is that you're going to put in the house. Uh, that part is also deductible, the maintenance, each year. Okay, so uh, I went ahead and took the screenshot here just because it sort of gave us a nice look at uh, including the example. So I just went ahead and put the whole thing in here so that we understand a little bit more about permanent capital improvement that ordinary would not have a medical purpose, qualifies as a medical expense is if it is directly related to the prescribed medical care for the patient. For example, we put an elevator in because this patient has a heart ailment and they can't go up and down stairs very well, right? So we stick an elevator in there, okay? 
here the cost is deductible to the extent it exceeds the increase in the value of the related property. So any amounts that you spend that are in excess of the benefit you're getting because it's increasing your property, that part is going to be considered the medical expense. And notice here that they allow us to include um, appraisal costs, um, but we cannot deduct it as a medical expense, but we can take it as a miscellaneous itemized deduction, although we will be limited to a 2% um, floor, and that really is a floor. I guess it's a ceiling. It's a maximum that we can uh, that we can take in the uh, in the miscellaneous category of two percent, but they will like to take the appraisal cost. And the main reason I point out appraisal cost because you say, well, how am I supposed to know if it's um, the cost of the investment is increasing uh, more than the increase in the value of the property? Well, you probably need an appraiser to give you that, or a real estate person, or something like that. And they charge you a fee for that. Then that is going to be uh, considered an itemized deduction. Okay, but not in medical deduction. So uh, we take a look at Fred has heart disease, and his uh, physician says he needs an elevator so he doesn't have to climb stairs. The cost of installing the elevator is 10000 and it increases the value of the resident, uh, residence to 4000 Everybody sign in? Everybody got a chance to sign the list here? Yeah? Okay. Okay, so um, what happens? Because it only increased the value of the residence by uh, 4000 and it cost 10000 the 6000 is considered what? Is considered the medical um, deduction that he can take. Of course, it would have to exceed the 10% of the uh, AGI or whatever it is, 7.5%, whatever the percentage is. Okay, okay good. Um, full cost of certain home-related capital expenditures for disabled individual to live independently and productively qualifies as a medical expenditure. So if you have to add ramps and things to the residence, widening hallways to accommodate wheelchairs, etc., all of that is considered a medical deduction and it is automatically assumed not to increase the value of the house if you do those sort of things for it. So you don't have to uh, consider that. So things like ramps, that sort of stuff, you just add those and you don't consider that to be um, a permanent improvement. Okay. All right, good. Let's take a look at uh, medical care for spouses and dependents. And we've already said that you are able to take those medical expenses. Okay for uh, spouses and dependents. And notice that some of the things that may have precluded us uh, caring, taking somebody as a dependent are not relevant when it comes to paying their medical expenses. So taxpayers may deduct costs for medical care for spouses and dependents. Dependents need not meet gross income or joint return test. So even though you would not necessarily be able to call them a dependent because they filed the joint return or because they had gross income that was too high, you would still be able to deduct their um, any medical expenses that you pay for them, again, exceeding the threshold that we've talked about for, uh, for our AGI. Okay, uh, Medical expenses of children of divorced parents can be deducted and it can be deducted by the non-custodial parent even if the custodial parent claims them as a dependent okay so they're looking out for the benefit of dependents here and they're simply saying look you know if you're paying the medical expenses for someone that would otherwise qualify as your dependent we're not going to start to step in and say okay you can't do that Okay. Now, I, I said the other day, I'm of the opinion that anyone should be able to pay anyone's medical expenses and take it as a deduction. So if you have a wealthy individual, and I think I use the example of Al Davis, supposedly the owner of the Raiders, who's now deceased, used to do that all the time. Anyone should be able to take those deductions. I mean, that's benefiting and curing a, uh, you know, addressing a real problem we have in society, which is what high medical costs. If someone's willing to do that, they should be able to uh, go ahead and deduct that. But 
unfortunately, I guess they can't. So I guess you'd have to do it through a charitable uh, organization, and then you'd be able to take some deductions. We'll talk about charitable deductions here a little bit later. I guess you could do it that way. Okay. All right. Good. Um, transportation costs to and from medical care. There's a mileage allowance of 17 cents per mile, or you could use the out-of-pocket cost. Okay. So if you got to get to and from, you can take that. Lodging while away. You have to go have kidney dialysis. And, you know, I should imagine that dialysis maybe isn't available in some rural areas, right? So you have to actually drive to where you can do that dialysis. And maybe it's going to be over the course of a you know, couple days that you have to stay to uh, complete that. Then they will allow you to go ahead and uh, take the not only the mileage, but also the lodging. Okay, although they limit it to $50 per person per night, and depending where you're at, you might get killed playing same somewhere for $50 a night, but uh, at least you'll be able to be deducting that. Okay. Okay, and that applies also to parents or um, you know nurses, aides, that sort of thing that are needed uh, to go along. Sometimes um, you may they'll need a special a person that can help them with that, then that's going to also be deductible. Medical care premiums, guys, don't worry. I, if, I try to delete those, but um, if you ever see a one of two and then there's only one slide or there's three slides, you know, and it said one of two, don't freak out on that. Those, to, from my, to my sense, is there are uh, irrelevant, but sometimes I miss some of them. Okay, premiums paid for medical care insurance are deductible medical expenses, okay, and we've already talked about that, that if the employer pays the premium, that is not included in gross income, and of course, uh, not deductible by the employee as the medical expense if the employer is going to pay it. Guys, let's not talk the whole class, okay, let's try to pay attention, because I know that you may be exchanging ideas that are relevant, but you got people that are sitting in front of you that might say, I can't hear Lord talking while you're talking. So, okay. And I always say that, and I did hear some people the other day saying exactly that. They said, you know, I can't hear the teacher because there's people in the class who are always talking. And this person said, well, what are they talking about? Like, is it interesting? And they're like, no, it's not even interesting. It's, you know, stuff about the class and generally not correct. You know, so... Uh, so, you know, I don't mind a quick whisper back and forth, but keep it to a mild roar. Okay. All right. Good. Um, not deductible um, when the employer pays for you. You can't take that as a deduction for your medical expenses. Okay. Okay. Good. Uh, Self-employed individual, 100% of your insurance premium is deductible. And notice, guys, it's deductible what? For AGI, self-employed, you're probably going to be filing a Schedule C. You'll take that payment of your own insurance premium as a deduction. Okay. Also, it includes amounts you pay for spouse dependents. So you have your own business. You don't have the medical coverage. You're going to go ahead and get into some sort of program, and you're paying the premiums for yourself, your you know spouse, your kids, whatever. All that is deductible. However, let's say the spouse has a job with, uh, I don't know, Kaiser or something. And I mention that because my friends, uh, both both two separate guys that were, we worked together at, uh, we used to work together at GAO. I quit. I retired. But they still, they're going to sit there, I guess, till the last day. But anyway, they still work at uh, GAO. I quit. I retired. But two guys both were the GAO, and they both married uh, nurses that work at Kaiser. Okay, so they both know both their wives work at Kaiser, and they both get on the um, Kaiser medical plan because it's much better, right? So let's say you have your own business, but you know your spouse has this great plan at Kaiser. Well, they're going to not allow you to deduct it if you could have been on that plan of the spouse. Okay, so you're not. You might as well just go ahead and get on the spouse's uh, insurance at that point because you're not going to get a deduction for an insurance premium that you would have potentially paid uh, for yourself. Okay, So if you could have been involved 
in the program of your spouse's employer as their dependent or as their spouse member, whatever, then um, then you can't deduct amounts you pay for yourself. Okay. Uh, Long-term care. And again, guys, those those are for AGI. This one right here is for AGI, right? And then they kind of shift here and don't make it clear that this one down here for long-term care, that's a from AGI uh, insurance premium. Uh, you could take that as a medical deduction, again, assuming it exceeds the... Uh, the hurdle that we're talking about okay so a little confusing on this slide in that what first big bullet here is a 4 AGI self-employed you're paying the premiums you could deduct it on your schedule C unless you could have been on your spouses and then uh, this bottom bullet is a from AGI if you're paying the premium for long-term care they consider long-term insurance premium they consider that to be a medical deduction from AGI Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at uh, reimbursements. Okay, if reimbursed in the same year as expense paid, the reimbursement will offset the medical expense. So you have, you know, thousand dollars, but your, you know, insurance or whatever reimbursed you three hundred, then the deduction is only seven hundred. Amount deductible is excess of expense over reimbursement. If reimbursement in the year after medical expenses were paid, so you can deduct what you paid, and then if you get it reimbursed in that next year, you have to take that reimbursement as part of your gross income. That's the tax, ben tax benefit rule. And again, we'll talk about that as it relates to um, taxes, for example. You take a deduction for your state income tax in year one and then in year two you get a refund you have to include that refund in income in year two because you had a uh, tax benefit in year one okay uh, if standard deduction was taken and your expenses were paid none of the reimbursement is going to be included in income obviously uh, you didn't get the tax benefit, right? So if you would have taken the standard deduction, then any reimbursements in that next year are not considered income because you just get the standard deduction anyway. Okay. Okay, good. So a couple of easy ones here. In 2017, a taxpayer age 35 paid medical expenses equaling 4200 In 2017, the, uh, the reimbursement was 800 by the insurance company. 4200 minus 800 means that they have 3400 that would be deductible, of course, subject to the AGI uh, limitation, right? In this example, since the person was 35, it was 10%. Again, I'll give you the percentages. Okay, in 2017, taxpayer age 35 paid medical expenses of 4200 and they didn't get the reimbursement until uh, the next year, 2018. So what happens? They can take the full amount in excess of the 10%, but then in 2018, under the tax benefit rule, they're going to have to claim $800 as income because they got a tax benefit in 2017. In 2018, they'll have to take $800 of income. Okay, all right, that's the medical expenses. And again, what I started trying to do here was stick the questions in then uh, from your quiz. They're in the, the Word document as well, um, but I tried to stick them in uh, next to the particular subject that they were relevant to. Okay, so we have Edna uh, had an accident called competing in a rodeo. Okay. Get this stuff. She sustained facial injury, injuries that required cosmetic surgery while having the surgery done to restore her appearances. She also decides to reshape her chin. Okay, so now we've got Edna, a rodeo star, who's worried about her chin. I mean, I don't know. I'm thinking, aren't rodeo people supposed to be tough? You know, they don't care how their chin looks. They're, you know, they're riding horses for a living cows or whatever so the surgery to restore her appearance costs nine thousand the chin part costs what six thousand so she can only take what the nine thousand okay so all right let's take a look at uh, the next one and uh, this one now is uh, 
Oops, wrong clicker. No. Clicker stopped working. No, wrong clicker. Get over there, clicker. That's not the one. Okay. Richard, age 50. <laughs> I guess Derek got somehow highlighted. Is that how our TA spells his name, too? No? Because he has just one R? So, or no, no, no. I don't know. I'm not sure. Okay. Richard, age 50, is employed as an actuary for calendar year 2017. He has AGI 130 and paid the following medical expenses. So there you go, Corey. Now you can see how much these actuaries are making, 130000 right? I think they should pay more than that, shouldn't they, for an actuary? Yeah. Okay, so what happens? Medical premium is what? 5300 Doctors and dentist bills for Derek and Jane, Richard's parents. Doctors and dentist bills for Richard. Prescribed medicines for Richard. Non-prescribed insulin for Richard. Yeah, Richard's like an insulin addict now. I mean, I don't, I don't get it. Why would he be going and getting insulin just for kicks, I guess? Okay, so, um, uh, oh, the reason it says 59 and then 2, and by the way, um, when you get into the Word file, that front part, I didn't copy it, and, and I put it in here, but it's not necessarily in the Word file. So if you see this question, you're like, where's that first part? It's not in there, and you'd have to look back to the slide to see it. Okay. But Derek and Jane would qualify as Richard's dependent, except that they file a joint return. Can we still take their medical expenses? Yes. We still can take their medical expenses because what? The uh, rules of joint return and gross income don't apply when you're paying somebody's medical expenses if you could have otherwise claimed them as a dependent. Richard's medical insurance policy does not cover them. Richard filed a claim of 4800 on his own expenses with his insurance company in November, December 2017 and didn't get the reimbursement until 18. He can take the deduction in what? In 17 and then have to claim that uh, reimbursement in 18. So what is the maximum allowable medical expenses? The premiums, yes. Doctors and dentist bills for his parents because what? The only reason he couldn't claim it was dependent was because of the joint return. Doctors and dentist bills for Richard. Those are his own. Prescribed medicine for Richard. Insulin, even though it's not prescribed. I'm going to have to figure out what's going on with that. That's just got my curiosity going now. Why that? You have to even call that out. And then total medical expenses of 20090 limited to the 10% of his AGI. Even though this problem didn't give you the 10%, expected you to know it, I would give that to you on the exam. I'd tell you the... Uh, percentage. So the deductible portion is the amount that exceeds that uh, 10% in this question. And then, um, you know, the uh, amount that was reimbursed will have to be claimed as income in 2018 when he actually receives it. Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at uh, Sandra, single. Does a lot of business and entertaining at home because Arthur, Sandra's 80-year-old dependent grandfather who lived with Sandra, needs medical and nursing care. They moved them to Twilight Nursing Home. Thanks a lot. If they ever want to move you into Twilight Nursing Home, don't go. Okay, that doesn't sound good. Okay. During the year, Sandra made the following payments on behalf of Arthur, uh, blah, blah. And they want to know what amounts are deductible. Now, they kind of set this problem up to make you think that, you know, she's just trying to get them out of the house, right? Because if she's ruining the parties, you know, she has a Christmas party and Grandpa comes out in his shorts or something, you know. So, you know, it sounds well she's entertaining some high heavy hitters or whatever. But um, they call out that what? Uh, he needs medical and nursing care, right? So as long as that's the case, then she can deduct everything but what? The cable TV service for the room is not considered medically necessary. So they'll do room and board, but you start going beyond that and having, you know, these cable TV and all that kind of stuff. That's not considered a medical expense. That's not considered room and board. And so you add all that up and uh, not excluding the... Uh, Excluding the cable TV, she can deduct the 620, 650, excuse me. 
Okay. Okay, good. Let's take a look at taxes. Okay, and what happens here? They are going to allow us to deduct state, local, and foreign income taxes as well as, so we got income taxes, and real property taxes are also deductible in the year they are paid. So state, local, foreign, not federal income tax. It's got to be state and local. Okay. Now, real property taxes do not include a special assessment for streets, sidewalks, curbing, or other similar improvements. So what does that mean? You know, the city comes into a neighborhood that's been there for a while and there's no street lights. And they say, hey, we're going to put street lights in because, you know, people are getting killed or something, you know, or it's dangerous, whatever. We're going to put sidewalks in. And they only assess the property owners that benefit directly from that improvement and they charge a supplemental or special assessment uh, property tax for that. That's not deductible. Okay, it's only the general typically county is the one that runs that uh, property taxes that you would have to uh, that you pay to the county that you would have to uh, that you would be able to deduct okay usually the county is the one that uh, receives the tax money and then the county later on will distribute it to the appropriate cities within so if you live in Alameda County you live in Berkeley you don't pay your tax to Berkeley you pay your tax to Alameda County then Alameda County distributes the money that um, is supposed to be paid to uh, Berkeley for your uh, property tax so it's the general tax no special assessment tax state and local personal property taxes based on value they call that ad uh, valorum tax now what happens here when you pay the registration on your vehicle they will often have a value portion and then they're going to have a weight portion so if you drive a real expensive heavy car your what your property taxes I'm mean, not your property taxes but your value taxes on your vehicle are going to be pretty high and they charge it by weight because what you're tearing up the roads more of your vehicle weighs a little bit more okay and so what happens the portion that is related to the value of the vehicle is deductible the portion that's related to the weight of the vehicle is not going to be uh, deductible we'll look at an example where you'll see how they uh, apportion that out between the two okay okay now if uh, taxpayers pay personal property tax on their car here it is right here the payment may be only partially deductible so in their state the motor vehicle registration tax is two percent of the value and then it's plus 40 cents per hundred weight hundred weight hundred weight whatever the hell that is okay so the taxpayer car is valued at what twenty thousand and weighs 3,000 pounds, their annual registration fee is 412. Only what? Only the part that's based on the value, the 2% times that 20,000 or 400, is deductible as personal property tax. The remaining $12 based on the weight of the car would not be deductible. Okay. Okay, good. Um, other taxes, Social Security your uh, Medicare, Medicare deductions, your Social Security deductions, your SI, SDI, state disability, all those taxes are not deductible. Okay, uh, Fees are not deductible as a tax. If you have to pay a licensing fee or something like that, it's not deductible as a tax. Although if it's related to a what? trade or business then it is going to be deductible as a business expense remember the guy had to pay for a CPA or something like that uh, and if uh, you're taking it as, as part of a trade or business it's deductible if it's not part of a trade or business and you pay a fee for a license or something like that then it is an itemized deduction but it's going to be in the what in the miscellaneous category not in the tax category Okay, so fees are not considered a uh, tax. Okay, real estate property taxes uh, for a year when the property is sold must, must, 
be appropriated between the buyer and the seller. So if you sell a home, you'll sometimes look and they'll look at the selling price and part of the money that you end up getting back from the sale will be used to pay, that you would have gotten back, will be used to pay property taxes. Well, if that's the case, even though you may pay all the property taxes as part of the closing of that deal, you would only be able to take the portion for the time that you actually own that property, even though the sale may show that you paid all of the property taxes for the entire year. So that difference would really be considered what? Part of the, really a reduction in the sale price of the home if you had to cough up and pay a certain amount of those taxes. Okay? So you have to apportion them. That's a must. Okay? So you take a look. Taxes include... Okay, and um, before we jump to that, I almost jumped down uh, past an important point. When we're talking about income taxes, you can deduct either the state and local income tax or sales tax, whatever is, and it's up to you, and of course, the taxpayer would be foolish to not take what? Not take the bigger amount. So we'll see some problems where the, you know, property uh the sales tax that the person paid in the year will be more than their um, state income tax, then you should take the bigger, you should take the sales tax that gets paid in a year. The problem with that is what? Now you've got a horrendous record keeping issue going on and every time you go and you buy a soda, okay, that's, you know, two cents sales tax. Let me go ahead and, you know, put that on the list of sales taxes I paid. So for practical purposes, it's much easier to do the income tax because it's right there on your uh, W-2 that you get at the end of the year, right? It's just going to call it right out, okay? Uh, but if you had some big ticket items that you bought, you bought a new house, you bought a new car, all of those so happened to fall on the same year, then you might have some items that are readily available there that you might want to take a look at and take the larger uh, of the uh, sales tax uh, or the income tax. Okay? Uh, for state and local income taxes, deduct amounts uh, that are actually paid during the year. That includes withheld estimated tax payments that you make if you're uh, an individual that is uh, self-employed let's say you're going to file a schedule c you're getting paid on a 1099 typically if you get paid on a 1099 they're not withholding your uh required uh, taxes your state taxes you maybe have to make an estimated payment periodically usually quarterly during the year then that is deductible and then amounts paid in the current year for a prior year tax liability. So what happens? You file your return April 14th, uh, 15th, 2017, but you're paying what? For 2016 taxes, if you have to pay when you pay your tax, you could still deduct that in what? 2017 because that's when it was paid. Okay. If we're dealing with sales use tax, you can deduct either actual sales use tax or uh, they give you an IRS table. So maybe that's what makes it uh, a little easier for you. And I don't know how those tables work. It might be worthwhile to look at the table at some point and see how they work. Maybe that says, well, if you are a family of X, your sales tax is probably this much, this amount, and you can see if it's more than um, the uh, income tax that you have. So you can either use the actual or a table. Okay. Um, Tax Cut and Job Act has limited the deduction to what? 10000 And you've heard me cry enough about that that I don't think we need to go on too much because uh, I'm certain that my state and local taxes are going to be more than 10000 If you add the income tax, state and local income tax that I pay and the property tax that I pay, I guarantee you it's more than 10000 Okay, And I think that's the case for you know the average... Californian. I mean, you know, we've got uh, we've got high property taxes because of the value of the, the property around here. So anyway, okay, there I go I'm crying about it again. But anyway, okay. So you come over and uh, you take a look at some of the questions now, and we have uh, Hugh 
a self-employed individual pays the following amounts, real estate taxes on Iowa residents, state income tax of 1700 real estate taxes on land in Puerto Rico held as an investment of 1100 gift taxes paid on gift to daughter, sales taxes, state occupational license fees, property tax on the value of his automobile that he uses 100% for business. And the question is, what is he going to claim as itemized deductions? Or they say, what can he claim? And so let's just go through the list here and we'll take a look. Okay, so how about real estate taxes on the Iowa residents? Can you take real estate taxes on the Iowa residents? Are you guys present or did you hear it? Can you take real estate taxes on the Iowa residents? Yes, he can. Okay, how about state income taxes? Well, he can, but what? The sales tax is more, isn't it? So he should take that. Okay, you take whatever one you want, but they would be foolish to take the lesser amount. So he's not going to take, can't take them both. He's not going to take the 17. He'll take the 1750. How about real estate taxes on land in Puerto Rico held as an investment? Can you take that? Okay, he can take it as an itemized deduction, not so much under the tax category, but he can take what? He can take deductions for amounts that are up to his investment income, right? So he could take that. How about gifts tax for the daughter? That's a gift tax, okay? You can't deduct that. That's not state and local taxes. That's probably a federal tax. How about... Um, we already picked up the sales tag. How about occupational license fees? Fees are not a tax. He maybe can take it on a Schedule C, or he maybe can take it as a, um, um, well, I guess he can't claim it as taxes as an itemized deduction, but I guess he could get it the 2% uh, miscellaneous category. How about property tax on the automobile used for business? That's a business expense, isn't it? Okay, so the total itemized deductions here are going to be what? The property tax for his residence, the 1100 real estate taxes on land in Puerto Rico that he held as an investment, and what? The 1750 of, um, he chose the sales tax. Okay. Okay, good. Let's go ahead and take a look at Brad and lives in a state that imposes an income tax including withholding from wages. On April 14, 2017, he files a state return for 2016 paying an additional 600 in state income taxes. During 2017, his withholding for state income tax purposes amount to 3350. On April 13, 2018, when he files a state return for 2017, he gets a refund of 8. Brad receives the refund in June of 2018. If he itemizes, how much should he take in what year for year 2017, which gets filed April 15, 2018? And it's what? It's not only the withholdings for 2017. It's also what? It's also the 600 that he paid in, what, 17 for 16 taxes, right? But since he's going to get a refund in 2018, he will have to take income for that refund in 2018 under the tax benefit rule. Okay. Okay, good. Interest expense. What happens here? We can take interest expense for qualifying student loans, although that's going to be a four AGI deduction. Investment interest, yes, that's an itemized, but up to investment income. Okay. Qualified residents, yes, we can take deductions up to certain amounts. Business interest is going to be what? Is going to be our what? Is going to be our uh, Schedule C business deduction, and therefore is what? 
for AGI. I have no idea how that came out of my writing when I was trying to write AGI. Comes uh, for AGI. Okay. And then personal interest expense is not deductible. In other words, what? Can you deduct credit card interest? Not for personal items. I mean, obviously, if it's credit card interest in a business, you could deduct it for AGI, but no, no credit card interest for personal items. Okay. Okay. So let's take a look. Deductions for AGI for our uh, qualified student loan. And the deduction is tw uh, limited to 2500 That's the maximum deduction is 2500 But they phase it out as you start making a lot of money. Okay, so what happens? If you are making between 80 and 65 they start to phase it out at 60 and it is entirely phased out at 80000 So we've got a $15,000 window there. Uh, where they will allow you to continue to take the deduction uh, and then it's completely phased out once you go past that, uh, you go up to that 80000 If we're talking about married, then the uh, the phase out um, range is 30000 So once you go ex past that 30000 it's entirely phased out. Okay, um, Not allowed as a deduction if you're paying the interest for a dependent or married uh, filing separate. Okay, uh, Not allowed for those claimed as a dependent, I should say, or for uh, married filing separate. Okay, All right, so you take a look, and uh, by the way, it's modified AGI, so it's Maggie, so it's going to be what? It's going to be... Uh, including in there things like uh, non-taxable um, uh, municipal in bond interest, the foreign uh, uh, deduction, you'd have to add that back. All of those things uh, go back into the modified AGI. We have the phase-out floor, whatever that is, and then once you have completely used up that range, 15000 for everyone else, 30000 for married individuals, then it completely phases out the deduction. Okay? So you take a look and uh, you look at uh, Kurt and Rita here. Our married filed a joint return, paid 3000 of interest as qualified student loan. Their Maggie was 142. Their maximum potential deduction for qualified student loan interest we know is 2500 but has to be reduced by 625 And the way they got to that is they took the 142 minus the what outer end of the threshold, this 135, right? And so what happens? Once they get past that, they're not going to be able to take anything. So right now, they're not what? Their difference between their Maggie and the phase-out uh, floor is less than 30000 If it was 30000 or more, then the entire uh, deduction gets eliminated, right? But their amount is less than that, and so they multiply that fraction by the 2500 and so they have to reduce that uh, allowable deduction by 625 and since their interest was what their interest was uh, their maximum their interest was more than the maximum so they take the what 2500 maximum minus the amount that needed to be phased out so they could take an 1875 deduction and again that's 1875 what for AGI it's not an itemized deduction so I could very well give you a question on the test where I'm going to sit there and I'm going to say, how much can they take as an itemized deduction? The answer would be what? Zero in that case, right? Okay. Okay, good. Let me go through that phase out. And again, guys, um, I am not interested in your memorizing phase out amounts, percentage, all that. I will tell you what the phase out amounts are. I'm not interested in you guys sitting here and having to memorize a bunch of dumb rules for, for numbers that next year when the Republicans get kicked out of Congress, they're going to change everything back to the old rules or whatever happens after that. Okay, I don't know if that's going to happen, but whatever. It's going to change. I, that I can tell you. The only constant in the tax law is what? Change. Okay, so we'll be able to sit there and and uh, I'm not going to have you memorize a bunch of amounts that are going to, as soon as you walk out of here, are going to be obsolete. Okay. All right. Good. Let's go ahead 
and let's take a look at qualified residence interest. Now, uh, interest on indebtedness that is secured by a principal residence and one other residence. So it's actually qualified residences. So they let you have a vacation home, don't they? Okay, or a second home, whatever. So you can take the interest on two homes, your primary residence and a second home. That's why when we got into the discussion the other day where we were talking about the vacation home, they were saying, hey, to the extent that it's personal use, you could take that as a, an itemized deduction because you're now what, using that as your second home. Okay, And so any personal portions of interest for the uh, – for the vacation home would be um, a deduction, itemized deduction as well. And of course, to the extent that it's for rental use, then it's a deduction, what, for AGI. And again, you get into the number of days that you used it and whether it's going to be, you know, how it's going to be treated uh, accordingly. Okay. Uh, so qualified residence in taxpayers' primary residence, and it's where do you spend most of your time. So since Mitch spends most of his time in the uh, apartment in Boston, that's his principal residence. But he could still what? He could still deduct interest on that second uh, second property that he has. Okay. Now the one other residence or second residence is used as a residence if not rented or if rented meets the requirements of a personal residence, et cetera, how many days you use it, whatever. Any interest that isn't taken as the rental use can be used as the personal use, right? Okay. And um, it has to be either acquisition indebtedness or equity loan. Acquisition indebtedness meaning what? Whatever interest I'm paying on the loan that allowed me to acquire, refurbish, et cetera, right? Okay, construct whatever. Acquisition, not refurbish, but, um, uh, you know, if I had to remodel the house when I bought it, that kind of thing. Uh, or home equity loans, okay? So what happens? You've got a nice house and, you know, you've got a lot of equity built up in there. The banks will be willing to go ahead and allow you to uh, make a loan against your equity in the house and the interest on that will be deductible with certain limitations. Okay, So we come over, um, there are limitations, interest paid or accrued during the tax year on an aggregate of one million or less. Okay, uh, Now that's the loan amount. Okay, so it's not a million dollars worth of interest. It's the loan amount that they'll still allow you to uh, deduct the interest on that loan balance. And it's an aggregate, meaning the first home and the, if you had, the second home. Okay, acquisition indebtedness refers to acquiring, constructing, or substantially improving a qualified residence. Again, I said, you know, improvement, meaning that... Uh, not if you just replace the countertops or something. We're talking about what? We're talking about the place was falling down and you kind of had it knocked down. In fact, there were a lot of properties uh, back in um, – a while back in Silicon Valley, um, you know, like San Jose and places like that where the people were buying the home, knocking down the home, and then putting this urban mansion up on that property because they liked the location but they didn't want the house. Well, obviously, whatever money you've borrowed up to the million dollars, of course, any money you've borrowed for the property itself and then the knocking down and building the new house would all be considered acquisition indebtedness, okay? But what? Up to loans of $1 million. In the Bay Area, okay, you know, you probably won't go for a loan for a $1 million, but you might have a loan of, what, six, seven 700000 to buy some of the properties in the Bay Area. So here we get pretty close to this million dollars, maybe in, in some cases, uh, for the amount of the debt. Okay. Now we come over and uh, you take a look. Qualified in residence includes interest on home equity loans. Okay. Now these are loans that basically use the equity that you have in your home as the uh, security for the loan. Okay. And uh, this is something that a lot of people do. Okay. They borrow 
against the interest on their, uh, I mean, the equity, I should say, in their home. And then they use the money for a vacation, for purchasing a vehicle or something like that. And they're looking at it and saying, well, I'm going to do that because what? I can deduct the interest on this equity loan, but I can't deduct the interest on a car loan. So it's a way of what? Lowering your interest cost by borrowing from the equity because you can go ahead and deduct the interest uh, on those payments, assuming they don't exceed the 100000 And there's also a limitation there in terms of the, you can't borrow more than the equity that you have in the home and deduct the interest on that. Although I'm sitting here when I look at these questions and I'm like, what bank loans somebody more money than the equity in the home and an equity loan? That doesn't make any sense. Okay, but if that happened, then you'd be limited to your equity. But then you can take that money, buy a new car, and deduct the interest on it, right? And so sometimes people would do this. Okay, okay, good. So it uh, comes in as qualified residence interest if you were to do that. So you take a look, and uh, there is a limitation, and it's either the, f the amount that you take in an equity loan, you're going to be limited to taking the interest on a loan that is the lesser of the fair value of the residence, reduced by the acquisition indebtedness, which is basically your equity, or 100,000, and typically, you know, it's going to be um, that, uh, you know, you've either gone ahead and you've taken the uh, an amount less than the 100,000, um, and, and uh, well, you are up to, or less than the 100,000, it's not often that, in my opinion, that the loan is going to be more than your equity. That would be kind of weird. Okay, but let's just take a look. Larry owns a personal residence with a fair value of 450,000, outstanding first mortgage of 420. Therefore, his equity in the home is 30,000. Larry borrows 15 that is secured by second mortgage on his home to purchase a new family automobile. All interest on the entire what 435 of the first and second mortgage is treated as qualified. Uh, interest is he's not over the what he's not over the million obviously for the first mortgage he's not over the hundred thousand for the uh, equity loan for the second mortgage and again I look at this if this dude's got thirty thousand of equity do you think the bank's gonna loan him forty thousand that is secured by what secured by the equity on what he you loaned him more than the equity right so it's almost always gonna be either the entire amount of equity or what or the hundred thousand uh, limitation that's going to kick in. Okay, you can't even if you had more equity than a hundred thousand, you would not be able to write up the interest on amounts over a hundred thousand. Okay, so uh, thus maximum loan on qualified residents that will provide qualified resident interest is what million on the first loan. That's the million on the up to loan indebtedness of a million on the first loan, hundred thousand on the second loan, which puts you up to what? One point one. And then the Tax Cut and Jobs Act uh, have limited that now to uh, seven hundred and fifty thousand, although they did grandfather in um, loans that were more than that that were made before uh, 2018. So it wasn't in 20 till 2018 that if somebody had uh, indebtedness uh, of more than uh, 750, they, they if, if they had it before 2018, they were grandfathered in and they could still uh, write off interest up to, uh, on loans up to the 1.1 million maximum. Okay. Okay. Good. Let's come over and let's take a look at investment interest and uh, investment interest is going to be investment property that includes stocks bonds etc and what deduction is going to be limited to the investment income so you can take it as a um, itemized deduction but up to the investment income Uh, so when we look at the interest expenses, okay, we had what? We had those that were for the production of rent or business or production of rent or royalty income. Interest is a four AGI. 
incurred for personal use, such as qualified resident interest, it's considered what? It is considered a from AGI. However, interest on the student loan is for AGI. And if the taxpayer incurs debt in relation to his employment, it is considered personal or consumer interest and therefore is not deductible. So I don't know, you have to borrow some money to, you know, pay for a car so you can get to work. You can't say, okay, well that's related to a business, that's what considered personal. Okay. Okay, good. Come over and let's take a look at the one question that I put in there for you for interest because I started putting questions in there for charitable contributions and forgot that I hadn't finished putting questions in for interest. So when we do the uh, practice uh, midterm on Wednesday, uh, Thursday, I will uh, skew it and put more interest questions in there. Okay, but let's take a look. Rick and Carol, Ryan, married taxpayers, took out a mortgage of $160,000 when purchasing their home 10 years ago. In October of the current year, the home had a fair value of $200,000. They owed one twenty-five. dollars The Ryans took out a home equity loan of $110,000. And again, I don't know why the bank would give them a home equity loan in excess of the equity that they have. But if they were to secure such a loan, they are limited to what? the taking the interest on the indebtedness up to their equity right which in this case is 75,000 okay so the answer is 75,000 here if they had equity of 110,000 cuz they could they take 110,000 if they had equity of 110,000 cuz they take 110,000 they're still limited to what the hundred thousand, right? It's the lesser of their equity or a hundred thousand, and so one hundred and ten thousand could never be the right answer in this question. Any amount over a hundred thousand would be wrong. Okay. Oh, I see. Well, for yeah, for the second, for the second loan on the home equity interest. Home equity interest. I mean, not interest in total is 1.1, right? But for a home equity loan, that's why we're limited to the 75. And none, the 110, the 125 could never be the right answer. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, how did this get here? Oh, this is another property tax question that should have been with the taxes. Um, but let's just take a look at it anyway. So at Lawrence County, the real property tax year, uh, county, the real property tax year is a calendar year, meaning it goes from January to December. The real property tax becomes a personal liability of the owner of the property on January 1st in the current real property tax year. The tax is payable on June 1st, and Reggie sells the house to Dana for 350000 On June 1st, Dana pays the entire real estate tax bill of 7950 for the year ending December 31st. How much can Reggie deduct? And your instinct is, well, nothing because Dana paid it all. But it still gets what? It still gets apportioned to Reggie for the period of time that he lived in the house and he was there from January 1st to April 30th, right? So what's that, four months, whatever? January, February, March, April. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, stop it there because I don't want to start charitable contribution and uh, obviously not be able to finish it. So we'll pick up charitable contribution. I don't think that'll take the entire class time next time. So we will start on the practice midterm next time get as far as we can and then anything we don't finish we'll get to on friday okay all right guys see you on uh tuesday make sure you sign on thursday and make sure you signed in okay all right guys see you